Welcome to Hosting HR with me, Leon Morley, founder of HR Recruitment Solutions. Uh, in this show, we're going to be discussing um, organizational learning culture. And our topic for today is, um, is L&D toxic to a learning culture? Now, before I introduce to our wonderful panelists that we've assembled here today, just want to mention we're live across LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and also on, link, uh, on Twitter. Um, if you'd like to get involved in terms of in the chats, then certainly feel free to do so. It'd be great to hear any questions or any comments that you may have as well. So um, also, if you're on YouTube, please do subscribe. It'd certainly be great uh, for you to subscribe and see our future shows that are coming up. And if you hit the bell notification, you'll see them as well. So let's introduce to our panelists today. Um, I think we'll start uh, with Nick. Would you like to introduce yourself to our audience? Yes, I would love to. Uh, Nick Shackleton-Jones, um, Chief Executive Officer at Shackleton Consulting. I'm, I'm basically like a Mary Poppins character now. Um, you know, my last job having been Chief Learning Officer at Deloitte in the UK, I now sort of float in and help organizations out with innovation, you know, learning culture, learning user-centered design, building their capability, helping to move into the future, all that kind of good stuff. I worked um, for BP for a long time, worked for the BBC for a short time, actually, with with Nigel um, and for Siemens, won lots of awards, um, published a book called How People Learn. Uh, so that's me. Fantastic. Thanks, Nick. So do you carry a bag with lots of big lamps and stuff in it as well, or is that just a separate thing? Lots of big lamps. Yeah, she brings out a big lamp, doesn't she, on out of her bag? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. perfect in every way. Yeah, and yeah, a tape measure. exactly. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Bag of tricks. Yeah. yeah, excellent. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Um, we'll go to Nigel next. If you'd like to introduce yourself to our audience, you must remember, Leon, that uh, Nick is always virtual, ne never real. So whatever lamp he has, <laughs> I'm an AI-generated character. That's AI lives in the metaverse. Lives in the metaverse, exactly. <laughs> And welcome, Piers. Thank you very much for being the first person to say hi. And Jasmine and Naomi. I think Naomi's working with you, Leon. Yeah, she's oh. yeah, part of the HR Recruitment Solutions gang, yeah. I'm not trying to avoid introducing myself, I promise. Uh, <laughs> my, my name is Nigel Payne, and um, I do a lot of things. I teach at the University of Pennsylvania on a doctoral program called the CLO program. And anyone who would like to sign up for a doctorate, see me later. Uh, I write. I've written three books recently, and I'm working on a fourth on organizational learning. Uh, I haven't made much progress on that yet, but I'll get down to it. <laughs> uh, I also present Learning Now TV uh, once a month, and I do a weekly podcast called From Scratch with Martin Cousins. And uh, someone said that they were driving, and they nearly drove off the road. They were laughing so much about some comment, a scurrilous comment that I'd made about some aspect of HR. So, that, you know, that's a, that's a good bundle of laughs if ever you're interested. And I also work with organizations on uh, helping them with learning transformation and learning culture largely around the world. So that's me. Thank you, Nigel. Celine? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm losing my voice already. Uh, I am, let's see, where do I start? I'm, to keep it brief, I am a psychologist. Um, psychologist for the last, I don't know, 25 years or something, um, moved into, I know, Nigel, I can see the shock. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I moved into working with organizations about 15 years ago. Uh, most of my time is spent uh, working either one-to-one -one coaching executives, uh, in, uh, actually across all sectors. So uh, people in leadership management roles across sectors um, and also then working with teams and with groups throughout organizations. Um, I work with a uh, hell of a lot of different learning and development teams uh, across mostly in Ireland, but also internationally in the States and uh, across Europe. And uh, I also, similar to Nigel, I teach on a program that's at University College Cork, that's a master's in coaching. And um, I, I don't do that for the money. I do that for the love of uh, <laughs> teaching others who are, um, you know, passionate about coaching, how to, how to become the best coaches themselves, uh, giving them lots of different tools they can use that they might not learn elsewhere. Um, and then also, um, my, I'm a CEO of a business called Adaptus, and um, as well as working with groups, teams, and with organizations with L&D, 
uh, we also create immersive uh, virtual reality first person perspective experiences and we've won a number of awards with them um, and then I guess finally to say I have written published two little books uh, which are all about helping people to understand their own learning and habit change. Wonderful thank you um, so yeah very very pleased to have the three of you with us today um, obviously one of the things that we do uh, on this show is we play a little game uh, where we get to know you a little bit better. It's time for Two Lies, One Truth. <laughs> That's right. So uh, if you're not familiar with this, uh, what, what e each of our panelists will do is they will tell us three facts about themselves, uh, two of which are lies and one is a truth. Uh, we will do uh, a reveal at the end of the show, so do hang around for that. Um, but yeah, so it's three facts, two of which are lies and one is a truth. We'll go in the same order because it seems to make sense. So um, Nick, if you'd like to tell us your three facts, please. Sure. So I'm related to a famous explorer. I have six uh, human skulls tattooed um, on my body <laughs> and a complete set of Viper Witcher armor as worn by Geralt of Rivia. Right, I was trying to write that last one down. I was like, uh, I'm not going to keep up with that. What was that last one again? Say that one again, Nick. A complete set of Viper armor as worn by Geralt of Rivia. Wow, okay. I thought he was saying he had gout. <laughs> you may have. Yeah, as well as having right. gout. As well as having yes, gout. Yes. <laughs> maybe, maybe They're all true. Illness, They're all true, Nick. Nick. <laughs> They're all true. Yeah, yes. Okay, right. Interesting. Can I so uh, we'll Celine to go next? Because I've just forgotten my okay. third one. Roll it out. Mine aren't yeah. nearly as exciting as Nick's. Okay. Uh, so, and I can't remember if it was two lies. <laughs> it's two lies and one truth. Okay. So, um, I live in the tallest building in Dublin. Um, I swam with sharks in Majorca three weeks ago. And uh, I went down a coal mining pit in Wales last week. Okay. <laughs> if that last one's true, that, that would surprise me. But okay. <laughs> but honestly, some of the ones that are true are the most surprising ones. So you can never tell. You can really never tell in my experience. <laughs> Nigel, have you figured out your third one and ready to tell us your three facts? Just about. Okay. Um, the, the, the first one is that I've had tea with the Queen. Okay. The second one is I've had drinks with Tony Blair. Okay. And the third one is um, I did some coaching with um, Prince um, Andrew. Oh, that's, that's definitely a lie. Because it's the third you're, one. You're, and you're such a name dropper, Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> Prince Andrew, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Wonderful. Uh, very, very interested to find out which one of those are true for each of you. And uh, if you're also interested, then we'll obviously do a bit of reveal. We'll also try and figure out and guess each other's as well and whose is right. So, um, but let's talk about organizational learning culture, shall we, in L&D. So um, the first question I have actually, Nigel, is for you to begin with. So um, I read one of your blogs as doing part of my prep for this show. And in it, you wrote, um, and I'm just checking my notes here, fundamental misunderstanding of what learning culture is. So I was wondering if you could help the viewers and our audience understand what we mean when we talk about learning culture and what you feel the common misunderstanding is. Uh, the common misunderstanding is a, a, a slightly crazy notion that if you increase the quantum of learning, by definition, you have a learning culture. And because it's a bit of a buzz phrase at the moment, you do hear that commonly. Oh, we set up a corporate university. That's our learning culture. We have every single person involved in learning at least for three hours a year. That's a learning culture. And it isn't. It's just a culture of learning. I think it's quite easy to get a lot of people learning. Uh, the difference, my difference, is that a learning culture is not just about individual learning but a way in which learning is used to solve problems, uh, work on issues and challenges for the organization. So a learning culture is about sharing. It's about communities 
working together on problems so that that the culture in the organization is to look for opportunities to learn not for not to look for opportunities to blame and for opportunities to deflect blame to other people so it's a, and it's also about bringing insight from outside i think it's very important that a good learning culture absorbs new information about what's going on out there maybe about the market maybe about uh, different technologies or different approaches is able to work together on decide filtering that information deciding what to do and then doing it so it's about accelerating the ability of the organization to adjust to a crazy world and i likened it to in a in a, an airplane there are gyroscopes which keep the plane aligned with the artificial horizon without gyroscopes no plane would ever take off because it's too dangerous the pilot would have no idea what was up and what was down and where the the nearest mountain was whereas in a in a modern airplane that gyroscope keeps the plane aligned regardless of whether it's darkness clouds whether it's turbulence and the plane's going up and down that the pilot can keep it level and i think a learning culture is very similar it's a way in which the organization has an artificial horizon so i can always see what is going on and make those small adjustments and sometimes big adjustments to stop crashing into a mountain crashing into the sea or flying upside down and i've i've had many experiences of organizations doing their very best to fly upside down and also seen organizations fly straight into the side of a mountain or dive deep in the sea because they don't have that ability to adjust and change so that's that i think a learning course is much more important than simply quantum of learning basically fantastic would um nick Celine, would you add anything to that or do you think i just to to echo that uh you know there's a lot of i find myself having these conversations a lot um and and it's 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 exactly as nigel says and it's very interesting that even when I try to explain sometimes what a learning culture is, there is such, there can often be such fear around well, what that means for us as a culture. And this means that we really need to um, start having more conversations, um, uh, a lot more conversations across the organization as well as in teams. Uh, it means that we need to start to ask a lot more questions to each other, be much more curious. It means that we need to develop trust and psychological safety. And that just seems all too scary. It's easier to have our tick box of uh, learning events or learning tools to help us to learn uh, the skills that we need to learn rather than actually learning how to be together. And by learning how to be together, that's how you then learn. Okay. Um, that's, that's much better than I said it. So yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go for that. I'll just add I liked... a little bit to that, if that's okay. So you'd have to start by identifying what, a, you know, defining what a culture is. So let's yeah. say for argument's sake, a culture is the values and beliefs that are kind of the core values and beliefs that are shared by a group. So if, for example, we say in the UK, we have a football culture, how do we know we have a football culture? Well, football is something that matters, you know, to people, they talk about it a lot and you see evidence of it. You see posters, you see it on TV. So if you were thinking about a learning culture, what you'd be looking for is evidence that learning is something which people talk about, people care about, and you see, you know, tangible, visible um, aspects of it, you know, in a culture. That's how you know about a culture. You walk in, you go to Japanese culture and things are fantastically clean and you think, oh, okay, this is part of this culture. But I, I'm just going to try and answer the question that you put, which is that L&D is definitely toxic by default to a learning culture. And I'm not going to make some, you know, because my background is philosophy and psychology, some abstract argument about that. It's, you know, anyone who knows me will know that's a hobby horse that I'll ride elsewhere. But just think about it from the perspective of an employee you join an organization i joined one recently and i had to do three days worth of compliance training under the heading learning and thereafter about 80 percent of the activity on the average learning management system is actually compliance related so there's a you know we in l d talk about it as if we knew anything at all about learning when the employee perspective on what we do is that we are kind of rain we are just this misery this kind of stuff that they don't have 
time for this relentless barrage of compliance of stuff that we have to do for HR, which gets in the way and which causes it to say we don't have time for learning, which is rubbish, of course. So we have damaged learning. So we are systematically damaging the good name of learning. It's, just, it's literally true in the sense that we learned a trick in, in BP, which is if you want people to consume what you're doing, don't call it learning because they'll just assume that it's nonsense they have to do for HR. So I think the answer to your, your question, if I can be blunt, is that ev every group of people has a learning culture. You know, that you can't not have a learning culture. That's what people do. They learn when they get together. But L&D is, it, by and large, getting in the way of that rather than supporting that. So the, the interesting question is, you know, how does L&D shift from damaging learning culture to actually contributing to it? It's interesting when we uh, we talked about the, the question of L&D being toxic to a learning culture. We we did a, a poll. In fact, I can, I can bring up the results now. I'm just going to ask you about this now because um, we asked, obviously, is L&D toxic to a learning culture? Um, only 6% obviously voted yes and 80% voted no. I'm intrigued about, obviously, in your view, I get the impression, Nick, in your view that you do think it is or do you think it's just that they've not necessarily had the resources or the way of you know steering it in that particular way so lnd in its current form but are you surprised by that vote in itself what percentage of the people responding to the questionnaire work in hr yeah probably a decent i think it would be lnd and <laughs> hr people but yeah i don't Tur know exactly Turkey, the, turkeys uh, don't vote for christmas i, I think that, you know yeah, yeah I, I guess <laughs> you know it, it, um it, it's 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 not surprising you know but yeah. but i think that if you'd asked employees and, and actually i don't need to make it a rhetorical question people like jane hart do regularly do kind of survey um, the voice of the learner um, mm -hmm. and typically they have a fairly dim view of kind of formal l and d um uh, and, and again hbr you know published an article recently saying that you know globally we invest about kind of 400 billion in training and development with very little evidence that any of it makes any contribution whatsoever the biggest single complaint about l and d is that people don't have time for it it's just it's, it's a pretty dismal picture um the question is whether or not we kind of accept that and try and do something about it or whether or not we just kind of carry on regardless i think hmm. nigel um what's your view on the percentage are you su are you surprised by that or is that pretty much what, what you expected in terms of the uh turkeys don't vote for christmas scenario I'd certainly buy that. Uh, yeah. the, the, the problem is that uh, if you ask the general population in an organization, uh, most are would probably be neutral about learning. I don't, some will maybe be hostile, but I think most will be neutral. What, what, I, it, what I would like is for the vast majority to be wildly enthusiastic and see the power and the, and the changes that are good, connected, organization that knows how to learn works and and people get will get joy and pleasure from that process whereas I, I think nick is right that a lot of learning is seen as getting in the way of doing my job you stop me getting my bonus you stop me getting those customers sorted out you stop me doing doing what i need to do and therefore you're a pain in the backside essentially. And, and that is because there's a, a very narrow view of what learning is. Uh, and that has been perpetrated, well, almost intensified over the last 20 years by a technology that focuses on delivering content to a desktop and having it timed and monitored and all of those things. So it becomes a kind of oppressive beast. It, it needn't be like that. I don't know how much of the great joys of learning in your life, Leon, have been based around working with an LMS and having content dumped on your plate. I would suspect not a lot, but there is a joy in learning. There's, I've, I, I get that every single day. I'm learning tonight and, uh, and I'll continue to learn. But you've got to completely redefine your, what you mean by learning and what it can do in an organization and not just see it as plonking dollops of content on people's plates and standing over them till they've eaten it which is essentially what's happened. I remember that from childhood. It wasn't a pleasant process mm. in childhood, and I don't think it's a pleasant process now. Celine, do you want to add anything on that? I mean, I was just thinking how, um, you know, from my perspective, a lot of the problem stems from... Can, so can you imagine that 
we we literally were just heads and we didn't have bodies and we were brains right and you know we didn't have bodies so then it would make sense that you know people just sit on computer screens and uh you know do these courses etc and or what we've had over the last couple of years a lot of virtual learning um, and even a lot of face-to-face -face learning it's almost as if the body doesn't exist and so even Nigel what you said there about you know you're engaged in this process you're still learning we're having a conversation we're having a debate we're having a conversation with people who are there uh, commenting and taking part in this hopefully and so you know even our bodies are a little bit more involved than I think a lot of what happens in the classroom so you know our learning and change is only exciting if we feel fully involved. If it's just engaging our thought, our brain, it's just not enough for us to get excited and or for learning to take place long term. So back to the learning culture, the learning culture can be created, can be uh, become more exciting through movement not through just sitting still. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I think um, like immersive learning. I think I, I know we, we did a show, I don't know if this is kind of exactly where you're at, but in terms of the whole aspect, but things like, um, like a friend of mine um, has developed a lot of work around sort of virtual reality and kind of, you know, the idea that you go through these experiences, kind of experiential learning, um, rather than kind of just sitting, looking at a screen or what have you. Um, I've, we've had a couple of comments in that I'm just going to share. So um, Piers uh, said a lot of people see going on courses as a perk. <laughs> um, it's interesting that I, I've used when I've hired, um, I've used it quite often, you know, in terms of the training development as, you know, one of the, the good things about good joining an organization, even within my own organization as well. So that's interesting. Um, Lauren uh, Waldman has said, uh, learning para, I love that. Um, L&D forgets that learning is something that we are built to do as humans. It's literally what our brains do each and every waking moment. If more learning and development professionals were taught some fundamentals about their brains, the process of creating a memory and how to merge strategy and methods with function of the thing doing the learning, we could change the way people view learning as a fundamental human skill. That That's right up your street, I think, Celine, isn't it, in terms of learning yeah. stuff. Before we go into that, because I want to talk a little bit about that, but I'm just intrigued about, if, if you don't mind, if, just how you would even understand to measure, like if, if you're a HR director or HR leader or something, or, or a chief learning officer or whatever, or even a you know executive on the C-suite or what have you, how would you measure whether you've got a good learning culture or not, like where, where would you even start to really understand where we are now in order to understand where we can potentially go or whether it's bad or whether it's good already? Like, how would you measure that in the first place? Can I just jump in quickly? I developed yeah. a, a learning culture instrument for just that process. So to, to help organizations get a, get a, a basic, not, not a detailed, not a, not a scientific appraisal, but a decent understanding of where the blockers are uh, and to be able to put their finger on on those elements so they can work on them so I, I think you can do that it is possible to get get an idea of what's holding the organization back and that's the important thing you've got to say these are the the the, the, the key three things we have to change in order to move the organization forward and it won't move forward unless we do something about that and then you've got a choice in in the senior uh, executive saying this is worth doing we will put uh, our effort behind this or they'll say it's too hard let's move on and I've seen both reactions but so you need your, to you need to know so in your tool Nigel what 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 the what are you measuring like how do you I'm asking the bit? I'm, I have nine 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 criteria not nine elements that I identified in my book on learning culture nine elements like trust and purpose-driven and uh, qualities of leadership and so on. And you individuals rank how well their organization is doing across those elements. And if you have enough people doing it, you then get a spread that you can then analyze and look at where 
people see their organisation. So it's entirely subjective. It's it's not not HR, but the organisation's perspective on how much trust there is in the organisation, how far they feel empowered, uh, and how well learning is organised and engineered in the organisation. So and about diversity as well, the ability to take diverse viewpoints and respect different viewpoints, all of those things are critical components. So it, it's basically nine components, four questions in each one, individuals make a decision and you you process the answer the answer it's not it's not complicated in any means by any well, means. off the top of my head what i can think of it probably fits into nigel's model but i think just superficially you look at build versus buy ratio right you know what percentage of our talent are we actually having to procure externally versus promote internally um you look at glass door reviews you look at what you know your employees and ex-employees are saying about your organization you would look at internal mobility because yep. in, in essence, learning is about challenges um, is it, just kind of rule of thumb. And so it's about whether or not your leaders are holding on to and holding back people in the interests of operational efficiency or whatever, or whether or not um, they're able to kind of move around. So internal mobility and, and how many job moves people are making, for example, within the organization on an, on an average year. Those are going to be the really interesting things. You know, are people moving around in the BBC, for example, there was a really active program that Nigel knows about better than I do of secondments and assignments where there's a kind of swap shop and you could go and do this, that, the other. You know, that's really illustrative, I think, of a strong of a strong learning culture. So those would be the sorts of things that I, I personally I would look at. Yeah, yeah and okay. I would just just add to that that the a lot of the conversations I find myself having in organizations like if you just have conversations with a few people in the organization, you will pick up on everything that Nick and Nigel have mentioned there. And, um, you know, so much just just when he, people say that they're they don't feel like there's a lot of collaboration or that communication isn't working well, that gives you a signal that you potentially have some gaps with regard to your learning culture. Um, and also a big a big uh, something that I think is really important is time to reflect. So. If people are just rushing and the pace is fast all the time, um, it, you know, obviously we see a lot of burnout. Um, but, you know, that appeals to some people. That appeals to people who can move fast. Um, and if they're moving very fast, then they're possibly not taking the time to reflect and learn. And if there's no reflection, then there's no sharing of those reflections, which means you don't have a learning culture because you're not, you know, a learning culture is when you're sharing those reflections. So we, we can avoid making the same mistakes again, and we can uh, share our opinions and our ideas and our solutions and our innovations or become innovative. Quite like that sort of uh, suggestion. You just prompted me that you could do it like ethnographic research does. You could just observe could. people in the organization and break yeah. out a pie yeah. chart of how much time they're actually spent doing yeah. experimental things or uh, yeah. talking about learning. You could do some semantical analysis. You could look at emails, how much of, of the, what percentage of conversation is talking about what have we learned? What do you learn? What are you going to learn next week? You know, yeah. um, this wouldn't be inconceivable yeah. ways to think about it. And how mistakes are dealt with, you know, whether they're mm. covered up, deflected, or yeah. opened up and almost celebrated. But I also think, you know, Piers' point there about a lot of people see going on courses as a perk. There's a perfect negative indicator of a learning culture where people can't wait to get away from the job and see going on a course as just not working. Then that's not that's never going to be anything close to a learning culture. Well, you still, okay. It, We've got to argue on this call, right? Otherwise, it's just boring. But it's fascinating. So, it, one of my contributions, I hope contributions to it, was to reset the the mission, our mission, to measurably improve experience and performance for the organisation. You know, so just take learning out of the conversation at all. It's a means to yes. an end. Well, what's the end? Experience, performance. Yeah. And actually, I think it's legitimate for us to do experiential things. Let me give you a real case in point. We're working on a number of induction programmes. Nobody's ever stopped to consider what these induction programmes should deliver. And if you actually go to senior stakeholders, as we did, and actually say what should be the business outputs of these induction programs you'd be surprised the number of times they say well people should feel welcome they should feel valued they should feel a sense of belonging they should feel connected and confident in what they do and then you say oh, okay you know those are all important things would you achieve that by showing people powerpoints for you know three days straight well no you know, so, so so why why are we doing that so i mean i thought it was a really interesting point from from peers but the perhaps unsurprising perhaps surprising rejoinder is that it's legitimate 
for us to do things which change people's experience of the organization, you know, and just get people together in a room and meet people and network, you know, that's okay. We're measurably mm. improving the experience of people that may relate to their performance. Um, so, yep. yeah. It's true. It's, and, and, it, you know, what I discovered, sorry, Leon it's okay. and Selena, I'll be quiet in two seconds. <laughs> what, what, I, what, what I discovered in, in my research was that if you want to build a learning culture, the, the last thing you do is focus on the learning. You focus on creating the right climate, which encourage, which includes all those things that Nick's talked about. Freedom to ask someone a question. You know, in many organizations, you actually don't have permission to turn around and say, Celine, how do I do this? I don't understand that. That's a punishable offense. And the, as I said before, that if you make a mistake, the last thing you're ever going to do is admit it, because <laughs> that's suicide if you do that. And never admit you have a deficit. That I, I don't really know how to do that because that's seen as weakness uh, and so on. So you, know, you focus on the ways of creating the right kind of climate, the, the things that Salim was talking about right at the beginning, about psychological safety, freedom to connect with people informally, more than formally, really, and the ability to draw resources from across the organization, not just from the little teeny up and down silo that I work in, in order to deal with some of the issues and challenges. Then. You, the, 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 if you can get all that working, the learning culture kind of tr trips along behind quite nicely. It's if you so let's focus on the learning, then you, you miss the point because there, there are bigger issues that keep people from uh, being able to, to learn efficiently and effectively in an organization. It's interesting from my perspective as a recruiter, because obviously I've recruited lots of L&D people um, and um, at, at different kinds of sectors, uh, different sizes of organizations, some international scope, global roles, some you know more kind of local, almost trainer kind of delivery roles, so kind of across the whole gambit really of the L&D space. When we talk about, and I st still see this quite a lot, and they say, oh, I've created this course because we had to do this thing, and you know, Nick, when you were talking about 80% of it was just compliance training, basically. Um, <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, what was the outcome from it? And they found it quite difficult, because it's like, well, our take-up score and our happy sheets were kind of saying, you know, that people thought it was great, and it was really useful and really helpful, or whatever else. But I've always sort of said to them, well, you know, from, a, from an evaluation perspective, I've been encouraging candidates to think it's really important that you really think about what that evaluation might be and they'll talk about things like you know can is, is is there something in terms of you know increased performance or productivity or something along those lines that maybe you could look at or, or how they might do it but i still think that even like going you guys talking about how you would you know potentially measure the impact of improving a learning culture i think in lnd at the moment where in theory it could be a little bit easier it, you know that evaluation piece is still potentially not as measured as much as it can be, if that makes sense. So it's just interesting for me hearing what you guys are talking about in terms of how you would measure it from a learning culture thing and how l and when I actually talk to people, what they generally talk, because none of them, or well, very few people talk about the things that you guys have been talking about in terms of how they would evaluate some of the things that they've done, which is interesting. That's more of a statement mm -hmm. rather than a question. And I'm, I know that I'm here to ask questions. <laughs> so... I just want to talk a little bit about the learning side. So there, there was a point, obviously, from, from Lauren earlier that we, we, we quite liked, which she talked about in terms of humans have always been learning. So it's a, a natural thing to do. Um, and I'm just wondering from your perspective, because obviously, Celine, you've talked a lot about what, you, that you can improve people's learning capability and how they can learn. And I, I was interested in terms of whether you think that's where potentially L&D should be more focused in terms of how do you improve the you know, the learning capability and sort of how people learn within an organization. I just wonder if you could pass yeah. some comments and some ideas on that. You know, okay, Lauren, Lauren and I know each other very well. We oh, talk okay. all the time. <laughs> she's here because I let her know about this session and uh, hopefully she'll write lots more in the chat. And she's a mind of information. Um, the thing is that, you know, one of the things Lauren does is she takes all of the up-to-date research and she translates it for people in learning to help them to think about how we can help people learn better and you know Lauren and I originally connected because we believe the same thing from my perspective I believe that that is what the learning and development function really should be for it is to help people to learn how to learn you know um if we think about what 
psychology, neurobiology, neuroscience is showing us. It, it, it's that, and, 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 and speaking from experience as well, I find that if you help people understand what, what's enabling their learning and what's blocking their learning, that they will take on a lot more and the learning that they take on board will be for the long term. It won't be just to get them, you know, that next uh, um, uh, career uh, progression. Um, and, you know, there there is so much that the, you know, the, the, the research in psychology, neuroscience, neurobiology, et cetera, is showing us. And um, that is not being paid attention to because a lot of people in learning who are working in learning come from HR or they have worked. I mean, I know loads of people who you, you talked about compliance training. Like I've worked with people over the years who moved into learning through other areas of the business. So they know a lot about the business, but they know very little about learning. And I, you know, I think people who work in learning and development, generally 99% of them are fantastic people who are up for giving anything a go. But I do think that they are missing a trick by not actually learning more about the psychology, the neuroscience, neurobiology of learning and integrating that more into how they're doing things. Um, just, you know, even the amount of information, you know, to come back to Piers' uh, point about it's, it's a perk. Yeah, it's a perk because if you don't like your job that much or you don't like the people you work with, you get to go on this one or two day training. Trying to get people to take on, contain, embed uh, information from a one or two day program is a complete waste of time. They're just going to go into cognitive overload. And there it's just too much information so even paying attention you know back to what nigel said about bringing people to have conversations yes of course if we can teach people a, a few small things on one topic and then get them to have the conversations get them to go away and apply it and then come back and talk about how they applied it what worked for them what again enabled them to do what blocked them and um, what helped them to really embed it in how they do their role rather than trying to just give people too much information and that's really you know from my perspective as i say that should be the role of people in learning and development is to help people how to learn because all the information we need is out there there are a million and one probably a zillion and one if that's a real you know number um courses out there there's so much information on youtube you know, when it comes to skills practice, I think that's where learning uh, people come in. It's helping people to learn how to learn and then help them to practice those skills and embody those skills. Thanks, Celine. I uh, really uh, enjoyed that. Um, it's interesting. <laughs> Jay, um, no, it was, it was really, really good. And I think it's, it's got some people talking here. So Jay um, Jupp has, has, has come in here and said, uh, I work for an organization we had a whole plan on learning how to learn because this is a real issue as well as time, deliberate practice, the psychologically safe working environments. And then she went on to say um, there wasn't much of an appetite for it as exposes senior leaders who perhaps don't really have it on their agenda. Yeah. So can I pass comment to you guys in terms of senior leaders and getting this sort of stuff onto their agenda? What sort of advice would you have for people in the organization to make sure it is on their agenda oh so much to say about this i guess the first thing is the show <laughs> yeah maybe <laughs> we, we don't have a theory of learning so this is the first problem is that we and and i i think that i'm unlikely to have a conversation about learning in my lifetime i've spent most of my career and will likely spend the remainder of it pointing out to people that what they're talking about is not learning but education so every time i hear the word learning i have to quietly think to myself is this person actually talking about learning or are they talking about education? 99.9% .9 of the time they're talking about education, which is broadly this kind of curious ritual that arose around the turn of the 20th century where you memorize some stuff and regurgitate it for a test. And bizarrely, it, that was only invented, by the way, just to keep children from getting trapped in machinery. And now we've started talking about it as if that had anything to do with learning. Incredible, really, when you consider that 
hundreds, literally hundreds of thousands of years have passed. Entire civilizations came and went without anything remotely resembling what we do in education. And now we've created these little toxic departments in our own organizations, you know, trying to force content, the expression that lies with use content dumping, you know, to no obvious end, you know, um, uh, and with very little kind of impact as HBR points out. So learning how to learn, good grief. I think that you asked a question about senior leaders. I think that senior leaders do have a really important role. I'm working with a few organizations at the moment and trying to shift the learning culture. The reality is, if you look at the Center for Creative Leadership, 702010, if you know it, or other kind of more reputable client research, the vast majority of people's learning is driven by the challenges that they're facing every day. Just forget L&D. You could get rid of the whole lot and it wouldn't make any impact on learning at all. The, the, the majority of people's learning is somebody rocks up at work in the wrong colored shirt, a partner takes offense to it, they learn something that's not tracked by an LMS. That is how people learn. You know, as Lauren points out, people are very good at learning. They're doing it all the time. We're not tracking it. Their learning is driven by the challenges that they have on the job. And, and probably the person who's most instrumental in shaping those challenges, in supporting people, in challenging people, you know, in helping them, in coaching them is, of course, the leader. And I, I don't want to waffle on, so I'll just tell you one story, which I thought was really revealing. I was um, designing a leadership program for a big oil and gas organization. And as part of that, interviewed, you know, hundreds of leaders. And one thing that a few of them said, was really fascinating to me, was I think I could do the job if it wasn't for all the HR nonsense. And, and he said, what, what, what all the, you know, all the people stuff, you know, all the, all the development planning, you know, all the performance conversations. And you had to sort of stop and say, well, I think, I think that is, I think that is the job. And, and, and generally in a good leader role, about 60% of it is the people stuff. So there is something in what you're saying that, that we can converge on perhaps, which is if you really wanted to change your learning culture. It would be pivotal to get your leaders to talk about learning i literally used to do this on every meeting at deloitte and my team i think some of them just sort of nuts but i used to start it with a learning moment every team meeting what have we learned what has anyone learned you know what do we want to learn next and you've got to get them talking about learning you've got to get them challenging people and and, and thinking about how they're going to challenge people because that will drive their learning so i think it is critical to get leaders at the heart of of your learning culture thank you nick that's i'm, I'm going to be using that what have we learned that's the next conversation i have so those in my team get ready for that that's going to happen from now on that's going to be one of the questions i'll ask when i'm doing a little coaching session so um yeah appreciate that um ian um, a little bit on this topic i think so he said uh, is education uh, unconsciously damaging the learning culture in the organization as most people have been through that system uh, yeah. and there and that is their understanding of learning i'm guessing there'll be kind of around you'll probably say yes i don't know would anybody say yeah or just nods okay good yeah. <laughs> it's i think it's linked to what you were saying just there yeah, Nick, as well so. it's, it, yeah. it's models models of mind but but in l d we've often got a bizarrely antiquated and narrow view of what learning might be and it, it's very close to some of the points that Nick is making about consuming stuff and memorizing it and regurgitating it. And that's called learning, whereas it isn't. And it's very interesting going back to Lauren, that in, when Brian Murphy was at AstraZeneca, he spent a huge amount of time and effort helping his people in AstraZeneca understand what learning emerging from the workflow and learning being returned to the workflow and how that learning could be shared. So he spent, he spent a year pretty much exclusively focusing on learning to learn, helping people learn to learn and not on content dolloping. And interestingly, on the, the doctoral program I teach on, I've just, we're just finishing the learning block and uh, Nick knows very well about the learning block. And, and one of the things we do with very senior people in learning is just take them back to the basics of different models of learning from behaviorism to constructive vision to social constructivism. And it's like a revelation to people that, that and, all of those models are socially anchored. We, we believe certain things about learning because of the particular social position we were in at the time. And if you, you, you look at someone like Skinner's behaviorism, that is just as much about looking at how we can modify behavior as it is about a, a reducto notion of human capability that, and, and the relationship between 
master and or teacher and pupil, master and servant. It comes out of that, that kind of context. And therefore, if you're trying to build a different kind of organization with different values, different viewpoints, then you, you need different models of learning. You can't, you can't put old wine into new bottles. You, you, you can't simply apply what was developed and delivered for a particular framework and say that's going to deliver a modern organization with everyone engaged and thinking and understanding uh, how to improve, how to share, how to solve problems. It just doesn't happen. So I think some conscious focus on what learning is and how you can improve it and get away from ideas that learning equals courses or learning equals LMSs would be very, very helpful. And, and I think it, we kind of bring back the joy of learning if you like, because we all experience amazing uh, adrenaline rushes when we get something, grasp a, a concept or an idea, recognize ourselves as, as different from the, the self that we, we thought of previously. There's a real, there's a real uh, joy and, and value in learning. And we seem to have smashed that on the head so that learning becomes something you do to get away from work. And, and do as little as possible when you're away from work in the first place, as, as was being said earlier. So, yes, I, I think we should be spending more time on this. And, and we should have better um, informed L&D that understand fundamental models of learning. And they don't. And it's not their fault. No one's ever told them. In, in terms of an L&D, do, do you think it's a reskilling of, of L&D professionals? Do you think it's should an L&D department look like it looks like now I mean there's obviously some in some organizations there are certain training or you might, might ambassador for maybe I've mis misunderstood the point but there are certain things you have to maybe sometimes know and how do you know that you know if, if it's all done sort of a more local kind of coach like what, what do you see as the L&D function how it should be like if we're saying if you guys pretty much are in agreement that you think it's kind of broken as it is and it needs yeah, to change just, and you've worked with them what, what yeah. should it look like it's a kind of bread and butter but I, I, we kind of be brief but because uh, everyone have a chance but really it's about shifting away from education to learning if as an organization you're happy for your so-called l d professionals to continue doing content dumping that's a kind of well-established route we all know how it works you go to the senior stakeholders you say what topics should be in the course you google the topics you copy and paste it into the course and you distribute it as powerpoint slides in a classroom or do it as kind of e-learning i've been an e-learning developer I've been a flash developer i know all of all of those roles all that very well it's not learning it's education it has a whole set of systems associated with it again it's got nothing to do with learning some sort of educational monstrosity it doesn't do anyone any good if you wanted to do learning and this is what you do is sort of shift to human-centered design very different simple transaction goes on there you say to the business what outcomes would you like in terms of think feel do how would you like people to think differently feel do, do things differently how would you measure those and you talk to the audience you do discovery and you say you know what what challenges do you face in the job you know what motivates you day to day and then you you build a kind of a matrix which maps those ambitions against the the kind of the tasks and the motivations people have. And then you build resources and experiences. So without kind of pushing that agenda too much, you can build resources which help people to do with the challenges they have. Or you can build experiences which challenge them in new ways. And those are basically the two kinds of things you can do. And so some of the skills are already there. Performance consulting, for example. Some of the sorts of skills that Celine, I think, was touching on around designing, you know, really moving, impactful experiences, you know, can, can be cycled into a model which delivers learning but but that's a big step away from from education a very different kind of ambition to, to realize mm -hmm. and, and also you... celine's co coaching as well but yeah what, one yeah. of the things that l d can usefully do is engage in conversations to make sure that, that the learning is embedded and behavior changes yeah. and to and to facilitate and enable those changes in the organization to me if the organization is fundamentally different one month from the next, then there's nothing going on. There's no learning going on. Because mm -hmm. if an organization is learning, it is changing day by day, week by week, month by month, and adjusting to a, a, an incredibly difficult and challenging environment out there. And when that doesn't happen, I don't care how many courses people have completed, there's no learning going on. Yeah, just to add to that, I, one of the simplest tools that I, you know, because Nigel, you're talking a lot about being, you know, being passionate about learning, being excited about learning and learning is, even if you weren't working in learning and development, learning is one of your top values. 
like I've known you for several several years and you are so excited about learning in general and you you're one of the most ferocious learners I know and the thing is that not everybody regards learning as one of the most important things in their life however if you can and this comes back to the coaching piece you know helping people in learning and development to understand the very basic skills of coaching asking questions listening probing one of the basic skills from from coaching is helping people to connect in with their own values so you know john or jemima's top values might not be learning they might be honesty or health or integrity or belonging and family or whatever it is actually helping somebody to connect their learning and their purpose and their why for learning with a value that's really important to them can make all the difference to somebody's engagement their motivation and i've seen it over the last 15 years of working in learning and development it's one of the simplest tools for getting people to move forward and to get excited. Thank you. We've had um, a comment from Susan, um, which was interesting. I think this is tied a little bit, perhaps maybe to what you were saying a moment ago, Nick, when it said, uh, so there may uh, also be a difference in asking people, especially leaders about things they've learned that aren't necessarily tied to work. Sometimes there is a psychological barrier of I have to have a good answer if asked about learning something big, bold, innovative, how, uh, sorry, not how to use the photocopier, <laughs> uh, but the barrier drops when permission is given by invitation to share anything. Otherwise, everyone feels that they have to have an elevator pitch of a learning mode. I mean, I would, I would definitely sort of agree with that. I mean, I've, I, my previous company, which is a wonderful organization, um, but, but certainly there were times where we'd have to talk about the things, the great thing that we did the day before, and it was always really quite sort of like sometimes it might not feel that great or whatever else. And it was always a bit like, um, oh, my great thing was better than your great thing. And it might just it might not be that great. Like you might have had a bad day, but you, you had to think of something that was great. And I understood the reason behind it and what they were trying to achieve and to build that sort of positivity and sharing good stuff amongst each other and things. But yeah, very similar to what Susan was saying in that particular comment. Um, I want to ask just on this bit. I mean, obviously, sometimes that you you touched on it there, Leon. Yeah. It's sometimes it's uncomfortable. Like sometimes it's uncomfortable mm. sharing these things, and mm. actually, there's a really fine line between being comfortable and being uncomfortable in learning. There has to be a balance between both. Making it too, you know, too simple, too easy to engage with, nothing's going to sink in. You've got to create some sort of challenge. And even something like that, being asked a question that makes you feel uncomfortable is, is challenging the brain a bit. It's making you think. And if you're not thinking, nothing's going to take hold. Yeah, I, I just want to build on that. I, I agree. Uh, um, I was designing a leadership program, actually, for a big aircraft engine manufacturer based up in Dar Derby. And actually, the, the thrust of program design is it's learning arises through challenges. If you take nothing else away from this podcast, I would suggest that's not a bad, you know. And so when I'm looking through a program design, if I can't see that people are being challenged, no learning is going on. If they're simply yeah. sitting, watching the slides go by, no learning is happening. And so, but there's a problem with that, isn't there? Because we we, dis we discovered that these particularly, these are quite introverted. And as a consequence, they're not very good at forming deep personal connections with their team. So we designed this little challenge. It was like a speed dating challenge where they had to, you know, every five minutes meet somebody new and form a deep connection, find out what makes them tick, find out what they care about. After a few minutes, they said we were feeling exhausted by having to do this, which is a good indication it was challenging. So what's the point in doing a one to five evaluation of that program? It's not entertainment. The best way to measure the effectiveness of a, of a program is to ask people, how challenging did you find it? So to Celine's point, you know, a really good learning experience may be quite uncomfortable. And actually, by simply by putting in place a one to five Likert type measure, you may be killing you, the learning nature of your programs because then you're incentivizing people not to challenge people because that will drive your scores down. So this yeah. is kind of interesting quirk I it guess, is of that method can i uh, just just build on that 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 I, I my expression is moving from safe spaces to brave spaces and one of the problems in l d is that we make it safe for everyone we, we reduce knowledge to a very safe package 
we never say there aren't actually any answers to this. Uh, we've got to, you've got to work it out. There's no one here who can give you the answers. So I, I think that discomfort is a, is a critical part of learning. And I bet if you pick on some of the best learning you ever had, there was a, a degree of discomfort with safety, but nevertheless discomfort. So we've got to get brave. You know, we've, we've got to move out of our little area where we are safe and where we know everything. And that's how we build the links across the organization, because we start to have some humility. We start to listen to what people have to say, because in many areas, they will know an awful lot more than we do. So I, I think these things are really important. It's about building an environment where people can really be up against the wall in terms of, their, of, of what they know and what they're sure about and take away some of that security, and take away some of that confidence of knowledge. And at that point, I think learning comes flooding in. So I agree with both of you. I think that that's a really fundamental point. So we've gone about it the wrong way, making it all safe and nice and comfortable and packaged, I think. Thank you. Um, I've got two further questions and we're getting to the point where we're almost at the hour. So, um, so I'm gonna ask you um, two. The first one um, is, do you think that L&D should fall in as part of a HR team and functional <laughs> form under HR comments. It'd be good to get all of your views on it. I always answer that no, you say no, I say it depends. You know, okay. I, I really, I, I don't think there's a, a, it can work in, if, you, if you've got a powerful change driven HR that is transforming the organization, it needs to have learning part of it. If you've got a process tactical HR that doesn't understand what the organization does, it needs to be as far away from HR as it's possible to be and part of operations. So it just depends. Nick? I think L&D is aligned with, with the HR agenda. If the HR agenda is compliance, which predominantly it is, then L&D is a compliance activity, you know, and demonstrably so. But if the HR focuses on employee experience and performance, that's a radical shift, by the way. There's a few HR teams and individuals who aspire to that. I haven't seen anyone who's really getting close to that. But then that's absolutely what L&D should be about the employee experience and performance. So it, it, it should be aligned with HR, but HR should be in a different place. Or, you know, it should be move away from the police leasing and compliance and it should take L D with it into employee experience yeah and, and i think there's some and, sorry, and just... D needs to sit on the leadership team mm. not under like what happens in a lot of organizations is that it sits yeah. under hr and so learning doesn't get to be at mm. the decision making uh um you know what I'm trying no, to say. Yeah, in the sense, <laughs> yeah. we, we absolutely do. We absolutely yeah, we do. know what you're saying. Yeah, and I think it, I, 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 I tend to agree. I think it should be um, in its own sort of separate light, really, in, in quite a lot of ways, but working very close. It's just like all functions work closely with each other. You know, that's that's what the that's what you have, right? You have to work in conjunction with each other and having a strategy at the top that kind of makes sure it all threads with what the business is trying to achieve. Um, but it's interesting, Nick, some of the things you talked about, we, we, um, a good friend of mine, Heiko Fisher, we did a show with him on what HR um, does wrong. I don't know if you know Heiko. Um, he, he's known, in, in, certainly in Germany, as the HR killer. And he talks very similarly, very similar in sort of style in terms of what your thoughts are. Just he's very much more on the focus on the HR side um, as well in terms of uh, you're more focused on the learning side. So, yeah, very interesting. You might want to watch that show back if you've not seen it. Um, so my last question for you guys is if there's one piece of advice that you could give to an L&D person or a HR person in order to improve their organizational learning culture, what piece of advice would it be? I'm looking for silver bullets here, some quick takeaways if possible. So one piece of advice that you could give. Start doing human-centered like learning design. Stop doing education. Start doing human-centered learning design. Stop doing education. Thank you, Nick. Nigel? Uh, look at how much trust there is and how much empowerment there is in the organization. And if there, there's a real trust and empowerment deficit, start with that, try and overcome those, because that, that, that's basically fundamental to helping to build learning in an organization. Fantastic. Celine? 
back to what I said earlier, the brain does not exist in a vat. Uh, our, our nervous system goes all the way to our fingers and all the way to our toes. So get people involved, get their bodies involved in some shape or form and, and change will happen. I'm hoping, Celine, that my nervous system does actually reconnect <laughs> yeah. with my fingers at the moment. Hand. It's, not, it's not reaching. Your learning just stops right here, right? Yeah. The <laughs> just, just, stop <laughs> your right wrist. <laughs> Wish you well with that, Nigel. Hopefully, uh, yeah, you'll you'll be feeling better with that soon. But um, yeah, we're obviously very close to wrapping up. We we need to complete our um, two lies, one truth. So I'm um, really looking forward to, to finding out which one of those are true. So um, I think we went Nick first, didn't we? Could you remind everyone of your three facts? And for anyone who's joined later on in the show, uh, this is uh, three facts that we each told, uh, two of which are lies and one of which are truth. And we're all going to guess now and then we'll get the big reveal shortly. So Nick, could you remind us of your three facts, please? I can, but I got it completely wrong. I thought it was two truths and one lie. So I told oh, right. two, two truths and one lie. So the, the three the three were I'm related to um, a famous explorer, a complete set of armor as worn by uh, Geralt of Rivia, um, and have six um, human skulls tattooed on my body, um, of which one of those was a lie. Right. Okay. Let us guess. Let us guess. Celine, which one do you think is the lie? We'll do it the other way around. Uh, I think the um, th I think this uh, the lie is the the relative the rela relation. Yeah. Nigel. The, the the well, he's definitely related to Shackleton, and that's not the the guy who sells fruit and veg down the market. It's Ernest Shackleton, <laughs> Shackleton the explorer. So that's definitely true. Uh, I think he has got some skull tattoos, but I wouldn't necessarily think the corner. So I think the lie is the the. the uh, full suit of armor because he's probably only got two thirds of the suit of armor not the full suit of armor that's what right. i would say okay i think it's i'm going to go the, the other one so i think the lie is the six human school i think i can see a tattoo there but six, again that's quite specific so i'm going to go with the six human schools yeah you're absolutely right leon i only have five <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> I'm experienced at this, guys. Five. Like... You did say five the first time. We should have picked that up. It's five the first time. Well, that yep. would have been two truths uh... in the line. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I do this a little bit. Now, I'm getting better at these, actually. It's oh, not yeah. just us people out. I think professional poker player is probably my next, my next thing in line. Yeah. Um, excellent. So, I think, Nigel, you went next? No, it was oh, Celine. No, Celine, was you went next. next, didn't you? Yeah, go on, yeah. Celine. Um, I said, I live in the tallest building in Dublin. Yeah. Uh, I swam with sharks three weeks ago in Mallorca, and I went down a coal mining pit in Wales last week. Are two of those lies? Uh, two of them are lies. One is a truth. I think you Come swam up, with sharks. Celine. So swam with sharks is the truth. Oh. Nigel? I, she's, she definitely swam with sharks. So she's, she'd be right up for that. <laughs> so you're also with the sharks. I'm going to, the coal mining one I think is really bizarre. I don't know why that would happen. Sometimes it's the most bizarre ones that are true in my experience. Mm, yeah. So I'm going to say the truth Leon, is the coal really, mining one. Really now that again. Really Have I got it right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. outside, See? 45 minutes drive outside of Cardiff. You can go mm. down 90 meters into the coal mine pit. It's a museum. Right. Mm. Yeah. Just as oh well he works in recruitment, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It really feels <laughs> just, just as well we don't, Nick. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've got to be able to read people, right? So it's, yeah. it's important to understand yeah. what people are not saying or how they say things mm. as much as anything else. Mm. Okay, fantastic. So two out of two for me. Okay. Yeah. Um, Nigel, can you remind everyone your three facts, please? Um, the, the three facts were that I had tea with the Queen, I had dinner with Tony Blair, and I gave a coaching session to Prince Andrew. <laughs> I'm, I'm and gonna... this is, can I just confirm this is two lies, one truth, Nigel? Yeah, two, two lies, yes, one truth. Yes, okay, okay. What do we think, guys? I think you... Coach Prince Andrew. <laughs> you okay. maybe did... You pretend to default her on it. <laughs> did go... Oh, crikey. Did go I'd say he had dinner with, my, with um, Blair. I think you did coach Prince Andrew. Right, so Nick's going coaching Prince Andrew, and you're going for drinks for Tony Blair, mm. Celine. Yeah, yeah. I'm mm. also going for drinks with Tony Blair. That's my mm. that's my guess. Is it drinks mm. or dinner? 
or tea? It was dinner. Anyway, the, the truth that all three of them are slightly true, but I didn't actually oh. have dinner with Tony Blair. I didn't actually have tea with the Queen. She was uh, 500 yards away. But I did spend quite a lot of time talking to Prince Andrew about how to encourage his children to love science and maths because mm. they didn't like it. Wow. And I was, I was running a science program and uh, he, he was one of, the, one of the official sponsors. And he said, mm. I have a big problem trying to persuade my daughters to like science and technology mm. and maths. What, what do you suggest? So mm. we had a, a session on that. Interesting. That might be a royal secret, Nigel, that you've just broken. It probably yeah. is. I'm probably going to get, yes. I'll probably be in the, the Tower of London by 9.45 yeah. yeah. tomorrow. The worst things to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've got some, yeah, yeah. anyway, um, <laughs> I won't go there. Um, but yes, um, thank you guys for, for sharing your um, expertise with everyone um, today. It's been a real pleasure having you on with us. Um, if you've enjoyed watching this, then please do um, hit the thumbs button on all of the platforms, whatever platform you're on. Or if it's Twitter, actually, you could do the, it's a heart, isn't it? I think on Twitter to say that you like it, but please do do that. Um, if you're on YouTube as well, you can subscribe and hit the bell notification to be aware of any future shows. Um, but thank you all for watching. Thank you all again for, for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, hopefully we'll see you again. Take care.